Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for truth. And I thank you that we do have a reason to sing. We have a reason to shout it. We have a reason to go to places where there, the glory of God is not being proclaimed. And Father, we can do that. We can go and we can sing to you and we can say that, that our God is better. I want to thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for what he's done for us. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can be seated this morning. Thank you. How's everybody? Has anybody been on a lake this weekend? Are you going to a lake this weekend? I know some of y'all are. Jamie Hudson has been on the lake this weekend. Jamie and I had the privilege of going and hanging out with some friends. So hope you hope you get to relax this weekend a little bit. Don't forget what we're celebrating. That uh, men and women are giving their lives for us as Americans. That didn't go well, did it? Uh, to have this uh, the freedoms that we have. So we're. We're excited about that. This morning we're in Scripture, we're in Acts. Uh, we have been in the book of Acts for a while. Let me tell you why we're, why we're preaching through these Scriptures. We believe that um, the Scripture speaks to us. Do y'all believe that? The Bible says God's Word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the hearts. So it even goes to the intentions. And so we know this morning that, um, that we could pick and choose the things we want to talk about, or we can let God's Word just speak to us. We decided to go in the book and just preach in the Bible and let the Bible speak to us. And so that's one of the reasons why we do our Facebook Live. If you are watching us from, from a distance, we're, we're glad you're watching. Um, we want people to be able to, to hear God's Word. And, and fortunately, there's loads of churches that are preaching and teaching and proclaiming God's Word. So we want to be part of that this morning. So I want to ask you... Uh, couple announcements before we get started. If you're a graduating senior, we've been talking about this for a few weeks, we're going to be honoring our seniors next Sunday. So please be here. Uh, we've got a lot of families that aren't here this morning being, at, uh, you know, different stuff going on. But we're going to be honoring our seniors, going to be praying over them, uh, going to be watching a slideshow of some of their pictures. Um, none of the bare bottom on bare skin rug stuff, none of that kind of thing. Unless Spencer's, unless Jan gives us one of Spencer, we might make an exception for Spencer. But he won't be here to defend himself. So there's that. But we want to just celebrate these guys, and there will be a time as a church we'll pray over them. And so, um, if, obviously, if you're related to one of our seniors, please be here if you're a family. But even if you're not, it's important for us as a church to stand beside these seniors and honor them and, and tell them that we hope this has not been their best year yet. Right? We want things to get brighter and bolder and better for them, then make them more of an impact in the world. So that's the first thing. The other thing is in, uh, in July, we're still nearing down the date, uh, Reed, Reed, where are you at, Reed? Reed, maybe in the back. Not Reed, you're not Reed. Reed, I think Reed slipped out. Reed wants to be baptized, but he wants to be baptized at a beach. <laughs> Typical. Yeah, it is choice. <laughs> we don't have a beach personally here, so what we're going to do is we're going to make a day of it. Uh, it sounds like a horrible day. We're going to get on a, one of the beaches, um, spend some time at the beach, have a, a little worship service, a little baptismal service on the beach, and then we're going to find some place where we're all going to grab dinner that, that night together. And so uh, I thought that would just be a fun time for us as a church. So we've got a couple dates. Reed's got to make sure. Reed's, by the way, our guitar player over here, in case you don't know that. But um, his band plays all over the south, and so we're making sure there's a weekend that they're not playing somewhere. So we're going to celebrate that with him. Also, if you'd like to be baptized and you've never been baptized, we, we do baptize here. We have a, a big 800-gallon uh, baptistry pool that we use. But, but if you would prefer to be baptized, Kyle, I mean, I don't know if you want to be baptized at the beach, or re-baptized, I don't know, but... But we're going to be baptized that day. So if you've never made your, uh, your confession of faith in Christ public, that would be a great time to do that. And so we'd love to celebrate that with you. We'll give you more details. Um, there will be caravanning, people going down together. So um, anyway, th- we've been going through this book of Acts. And we, we have this overall summary of the book of Acts. The theme is when empowered by the Holy Spirit, ordinary people will see a supernatural move of God. If you ask what the book of Acts is, it says ordinary people. You don't have to be a superstar. You don't have to be some kind of major talent. You don't have to be uh, anything, as the world would say, super special. But we know that when the Holy Spirit gets hold of a person, that God does tremendous things. And so the book of Acts is this story of when the Holy Spirit got a hold of some people and the church became unleashed. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a church you felt was unleashed. The word unleashed implies power, almost a little recklessness, a little, a little can't predict them. And most churches that you and I have been a part of would never say, man, that church was unleashed. That's kind of a different kind of word. But our prayer is that the church would be this mighty force, this mighty organization that represents God and what God is doing. So here's a question for you. I want, and we're going to play a little, little word game together. What organizations... Have any of you been involved in in your life? It could be anything. Give me some examples. Cub Scouts. Would anybody say Cub Scouts Unleashed? No. 
You don't think of Cub Scouts. Maybe, maybe some, maybe individual Cub Scouts. Think of HOAs. HOA unleashed. No. Any other organizations you've been involved in? PTA? Blair says, Blair says leash them, not unleash them. Indian guys? Guides, okay. What, what other groups have you been involved in? Maybe you had a supper club, right? Maybe, or do people still do supper clubs? Is that a thing anymore? It is? I do supper. I don't know about supper clubs. Come, come hang out, we'll make a club out of it. It'll be awesome. I associate with dinner. I'm, I'm about that club. But think about it. Think about all those clubs, and I want to ask you this. If there was a club for any length of time, I guarantee you there was a moment where tension came into it, right? Right? Every, every group. Uh, Kyle and Sebby, all members of the Alabama Bar. I'm hoping. You, you have to be kind of to do what you do. If you're not, I just called you out to the Internet. Uh, there, I, I know there has been tensions in the bar. I have seen things. I actually know a guy that's a lawyer, and I Googled his name the other day. I didn't know he'd had, like, charges against him. I was like, I've seen stuff. I was like, click XXX, where this guy was in another state. And I, I, I'm like, okay, it's public knowledge what this guy did. Every organization is going to have tensions. Every organization has. And the church is not excluded from that. We're not vaccine from that. It's not like because we're all Christians. And if I asked you, if you grew up in church, and Neil Hughes from the Montgomery Baptist Association is here. Neil could preach this sermon for me, couldn't you, Neil? If I said, talk about tensions in the church, he'd be like, how much time? This is my part one of a 20-part series on Montgomery Baptist Association, Tensions in the Churches. It's, it's going to happen because we're all, we're all people that are, that are selfish and greedy, and we've got our own in, intentions and our own desires. And God says, I'm going to redeem you, but you still got some of that old left in you. Right? We're becoming who he says we are. And I'm going to throw you together, and I'm going to put different peoples and different backgrounds, different demographics, different racial backgrounds, and you're going to be completely different from each other, and I'm going to throw you together and let you live life together. Which in one way is beautiful, and one way it's a train wreck waiting to happen. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at the scripture. So we've been in Acts. God has been growing his church. There's been multiple uh, revivals where at one point 3,000 people were baptized one day, another time 2,000 were added. All this stuff is happening. God's grown his church. And then we're getting into the weekly doings of the church. We're going to read this together. It's in Acts chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, follow with us. If not, you can look on the screens. It says, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, so God's growing, it says the Hellenistic Jews, that means the people who are of Greek origin. Okay? The ones who were Greek-speaking. So you got, this has got some racial stuff going on, too. The Hellenistic Jews, among them, complained against the Hebraic Jews. Two different backgrounds. You got folks who came from kind of a Greek background, folks who came from a Jewish background. Because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve, this is the, the main disciples, gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Speaking real blunt. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group, and they chose Stephen, who we're going to find out more about later on in the book of Acts, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles, who prayed and laid their hands on them, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. I read an article this week. There was a, a church in Dallas that split, and it had a large, um, it's one of those things, they bought a, a piece of land, they built a building, and Dallas grew up around it. Have you ever been to Dallas? Dallas is just like this weed that just grows everywhere. It's just huge. And this church had bought this chunk of land when it was just nothing, and the city had grown up around it, and then there were some tensions, and they were, the church was going to split, and they realized that the, the value of the land was a lot, not just a little bit. Somebody had donated, like, farmland before, and the farmland had become, like, middle of, you know, commerce land, and zoning had changed, and the church land had, like, 50 to 60 times uh, gone up in value. And so there was a discussion about that, Right? Who's going to get the church land? And in, in court, they had to go back to what the source of the argument was. And they went through all these things, all these interviews. This is a true story. And they found out that it all started with one man, an old man, an elder in this church got mad because a child had gotten more ham on their plate than he had gotten at a, at a dinner. 
That's where it started. And we laugh at that. But Neil could, could tell you stories of churches splitting over carpet color. I know of a church that did that one time. Could be over something somebody said in a pulpit. Could be over, there's, there's a list of reasons. And, and we know that, that we've all been a part of organizations that were not perfect organizations. I've been in HOAs. You should go to our HOA. It is the funniest thing. I'm not going to go into details because people watch the internet, but it is hilarious, the things. I keep, I keep wanting pro- to propose we build a tunnel, which t- totally tongue-in-cheek, but the people that are for the tunnel would be voting for it, and, and just everything in the world that comes up can come up. And this is a simple, there's probably 30 families in our neighborhood. This is not a large, you know, multinational organization. It's just a small little HOA. If people get together, there will be tensions, and the church is not immune to that. So here's what's happening in this story. You've got the church is growing, the church is booming, God's doing his thing, God's growing his organization, this eternal thing he's going to give us, and then people get their feelings hurt. We weren't getting enough food. What we don't know is what really was happening, right? There's always my opinion and your opinion, and then the truth is somewhere in the midst of all that. But what we know, as they said, these people felt like they were being overlooked in the food distribution. In other words, we saw earlier where they were pulling all the resources given to those who had need. And so obviously there's some folks who have need, and they feel like they're not getting as much of their stuff as they should. So I want to do two things this morning. I want us to look at these scriptures and ask the first question, what do we learn from them? Right? We want to look at Scripture. What do we learn from it? What is, what is God showing us? We believe the Word of God is timely. So this book written a couple thousand years ago is still timely today. I think it's hilarious how on point it is with today. So one, what do we learn from it? And then two, what do we do with this? Because what we don't want is for you to come in here and to hear some nice words. Thank you for being here on a Sunday, by the way. You could have been at the lake, could have been at home. It's hot as blue blazes outside. Um, they're like, if you look at the map, there's like two places on earth that are going to be 100 degrees this weekend. Jamie said the Sahara. It's like Alabama and the Sahara. Go look at the map. I mean, I heard a reporter say there's some unconfessed sin that God's dealing with us about. We're, there's some judgment we're facing. You know, everything has a repercussion. So I'm not sure what that is. But so what do we learn from it? And then what are we going to do with it? How are we going to live out this change? Okay, number one, the first thing we want to learn is the church is the only eternal organization ever created. Your HOA is not going to live forever, praise the Lord. Okay, Cub Scouts, though great and wonderful, it's not ever promised to live forever. I want to to share some scriptures with you. In Matthew, Jesus' teaching before he was crucified, dead, buried, resurrected, it says, Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? In other words, what's the scuttlebutt on the street about me? what's, What's the rumor mill saying? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus asked this, I love the questions Jesus asks. What about you? What do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Look what he says. And you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. If you have a Catholic friend, their faith, what they believe about church is hinged on this verse. We believe that the confession is the rock. When when Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, the Catholic church will say that that Peter himself, that papal line is is the confession. We believe that it's on the confession. I tell you that you are Peter on this rock. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So Christ says this, I have a thing I'm building. I'm starting a new organization. I've been hinting at it since the beginning of time. Even in the garden, there were hints of it. And then the tabernacle time hints at it, and the Levitical system, and the sacrifices, all that hints at it. But I want you to know something. I'm starting it now. If there were incorporation papers, he'd have filed them. If he needed an LLC, he'd have filed it. He'd have put the 12 disciples with Judah like in the little floating position. He'd have had them all lined up. They're going to be the leaders of the organization. They're going to carry it out. Here's the mission, the great commission. That's what things supposed to do. He'd have filed papers. That's not how they did things then. But he said this, Peter, I'm going to build this thing, and it's never, ever, ever going to fail. Never. No matter how dark, how lonely, how dry it gets, I'm never, ever, ever going to let this thing called the church fail. Doesn't that encourage you? It should. The hope of the world is the local church. The hope of the world. Billy Graham crusades are phenomenal. But better than Billy Graham crusades is the local church. My friend Lee leads the BCM out at, at AUM, not trying to use 
you know, just letters for you. The Baptist campus ministry. The Baptist campus ministry is just phenomenal. But if you ask Lee, he said, Lee, what's the hope of the world? He'd say this, the local church. Which is why he's preaching at First Baptist Troy this morning, the gospel. Which is why we believe no matter if there's 10 of us or 100 of us or 1,000 of us or 10,000 of us, that the hope of the world is you and I coming in here, worshiping the Lord together, hearing his word, being empowered, encouraged, forgiveness of sins through the local church. We believe that all these wonderful things happen through the local church church and Christ said I'm going to build my organization and it will never ever ever fail I think in my life the best things in my life came through the local church as we're worshiping today all these people on stage which I love and my friends all of you that are here the ones who couldn't be here today that are, that are here usually I have met all of you through the local church I think of Chuck Jones and Jenny y'all are some of my, my favorite people in the whole world I met you through the local church Church, Kyle and Stephanie, all, the, all these people that, that you guys are close to in the church, God brought us together through this thing called the local church. He said, I will build my church. Don't you love the intimacy of that? My church. He didn't say a church or somebody's church. I'm going to start something. Maybe it'll start. Maybe it'll continue. Maybe it won't. Eh. It wasn't an experiment. There are no odds against it. 100% chance God's church will always stand. Always. When... We talked to Jew and our friend that's in India, and he, I asked him one time, I said, tell me stories. The guy's got crazy stories. Like, if, do you want a gross story? Got a gross story. You want a crazy story? You want a story about elephants pushing over huts? I got that story. And I said one time, tell me about a story you went and preached the gospel. He said, I heard about a village that there's no record of, e- of any missionaries ever getting to this village with the gospel. Ever. In the history of the world. This little place up in the mountains of India that they have no record of anybody ever getting there. And he realized, he said, I was laying in bed one day and I realized that God did not get glory through Jesus in that spot. And it bothered me. So I said, what did you do? He said, I went to that village. Of course you did, Juan. He said, I hiked like three or four days, walked in the mountains. He ran out of food. He said, Lord, you got to give me, you just got to give me some, you got to give me, you got to take care of my hunger. And he had nothing. He said, God just would take care of his hunger. It's crazy stuff. He got there and he started preaching and people started coming to Christ and he taught them songs that had the word hallelujah. When you sing the word hallelujah, it means God must be praised. Hallel is a command. Praise God. And he said, he taught them that, and he says, for the first time, the name Jesus was echoing over these canyon walls and over these, over these forests and these trees that had never heard the name of Jesus before. How cool is that? And he planted a church, and guess what? The church will always stand. Jewin told us one time, I, he said he got thrown in prison for preaching the gospel in India. So he said, I said, what'd you do? I preached the gospel some more. What happened next? They threw me out of jail for preaching the gospel. He said, so I go in jail, I preach the gospel. I preach the gospel, I get out of jail. I said, so it's like, you can do whatever he goes. I just preach the gospel. God takes care of the rest. Baptized 2,000 plus people personally. Jewin believes in this organization just like I do. Everything else in life will fail. The people who own your mortgage will fail. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe they'll sell it to somebody else. But the church of Christ will always, always, always be because of our founder and his promises. The second thing that we can learn is as God grows his church, Satan does everything he can to distract. It says, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained Against, they didn't say, it doesn't say the Hellenistic Jews had a legit concern and went to the Hebraic Jews 101 to solve it peacefully. It doesn't say they practiced Matthew 18 and went one to one and handled things quietly, not to form a, a divide. It says they complained. Now, here, I want to I share some verses with you. And our, our point today is not about Satan because he's a punk and he's getting punched in the neck, but we should know who he is and what he does. You can quote me on that. He's a punk. He should be punched in the neck, and he will, which I love. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And we have this idea, this cute, you know, we have the cherubim version of angels, right, sitting on, on clouds, fat little babies, selling toilet paper. You've seen that. We've talked about that before. And then you have, you have like the little spike horn version of Satan that we like to think. Here's the thing we have, a, we completely dismiss. Now, here's the thing. He is not equal with God. This is not a 50-50 kind of thing. It's not like God is struggling and Satan is struggling. God is omnipotent, all-powerful, sovereign Lord, creator of the whole universe. We know that, right? You can say amen to that. That should give you some peace. And Satan is an adversary. Now, he'll, he can destroy people apart from God's protection, but know this. He's not God's equal. He's not, he's not, he's not the 
God doesn't like, oh, I'm really struggling against Satan. No, God is the omnipotent, all-powerful creator of the universe. But in some way, some mystery, there's this struggle that we're in that God allows. It's ultimately to give God more glory. So here's what these verses say. Ephesians 6 says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of all evil in the heavenly places. James 4 says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 1 John 4, 4 says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Romans 8, 37 says, knowing all these things are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 1 Corinthians 15 says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the verses are numerous and on and on and on about we're in this spiritual battle. It's crazy the things you'll see. If you've been in ministry for a long time, we were at a, a retreat one time and had a lot of kids there who we knew weren't Christians. A lot of crazy backgrounds, a lot of, a lot of kids who had broken homes. Um, we had a we'd gotten involved in this ministry that, um, of kids who were in state orphanages. And so we had dozens of kids who had all kinds of crazy stuff in their backgrounds. And my guest speaker that weekend was preaching the gospel, and I was sitting in the back with the leaders kind of praying over the room, and you could watch confusion happen. Some of y'all were there. You could watch little kids were like coughing and, and, and like distracted. And, and, I, and, and my spirit was like, God's moving, and Satan hates this. He hates the fact that... that the Bible's being teached that we're proclaiming you can find forgiveness in Christ and Christ alone. There's no other way to have the Father except through him. There's no, there's no peace apart from Christ. There's no forgiveness. There's no redemption. And I, you could literally watch the struggle. You could watch. We've seen it in our church when God's moving and things start happening and, and tensions arise and confusion. Right? We've seen it over and over again. And in your flesh, you can go, we get frustrated and mad at people. It's not against people, but you got to go, okay, Lord, where do we go? We need to go to the spirit world. We need to pray and ask the Father to calm things and drive out Satan. Because here's the thing. When God's moving in your life, Satan hates it. He doesn't want you to be all that you can be in Christ. He wants you to be distracted. He doesn't want you to be in the Word. He doesn't want you to have fellowship with each other. He wants you to be caught up in something that doesn't matter to forget the thing that does. And this happened in this story, too. The third thing we learn is this. Churches must maintain focus on their primary mission. I don't think any of them would say our primary mission is to hand out food. Now, here's the thing. That's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to help the needy. We need to help the needy. But nobody would say that that social gospel, that social function of helping people in need, that's not the only primary focus of the church. Look what it says. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Now, our English is kind of, that almost seems a little snarky, doesn't it? I'm not a waiter. I'm not getting paid on tips. That's the, the, the original language didn't have that. They're just saying, we need to maintain this thing so as not just do this thing. What they're also saying is, there are a lot of people who can do this other thing, but there's only a few of us that really need to be doing this, this main thing, this main focus, this, this point of the spear. So if you ask, well, what, what's the main thing? We believe at Catalyst, we exist so that people far from God can find life and liberty in Jesus Christ. Next slide, guys. Look at that for me. We believe that catalyst exists so that people far from God can find life and liberty in Jesus Christ. You go, well, Matt, does that include rich people? Are they far from God? A lot of them are. Does that include poor people? Yeah. Does it include people who don't even know they're lost? By all means. Does it include Christians who have received forgiveness but have strayed from God and have walked away from the church? Yes. Does it involve me when I've screwed up and had an affair with my wife? Yeah. Does it involve my kids who I'm not even speaking with? Yeah. When we started this place, we, we believed that God was calling us to, find, to, to, to create a place for a niche of people who might not fit in a normal church. We, we wholeheartedly believe this. And I love the diversity of churches in our town, but there are a lot of churches where if you've been raised in church, you will fit in perfect. And, and they sing the songs you know. We sang a hymn back in the back this morning, and Chloe's like, didn't even know any of the words. We're having to feed the words to her. And the songs we pick, the way we dress, the way we communicate, all that is done because we know, that I believe that God gives us some freedom in the, in the methods. The message is always the same, but the methods, I think there's some freedom in that. 
And so we believe that, that there are people that are far from God. A survey was done a few years ago, and basically they identified there was a, people said there was 100,000 people in the river region that went to church somewhere. Now, I don't believe for one second that 100,000 people are in church this morning. You're like, it's Memorial Day. Let's go to Easter or Christmas. There's not enough capacity in this town for 100,000 people to go to worship on Sunday mornings at those times. So I believe the vast majority, they say there's 300,000 plus people in the, in the river region. I believe the majority of people aren't in church at all. So here's what I know. I know that Billy Graham, they asked him in his server, they said, how many uh, uh, out of every 10 church-going people do you really believe are true Christians? He said, I don't know, but I would bet three out of 10. Now, you may not know Billy Graham, but like my, my, my family said he was like the Baptist Pope. If we had a Pope, he was it. <laughs> Loved the Lord, like phenomenal man, did phenomenal things. And if Billy Graham believed that three out of every ten people are truly saved, and the majority of people aren't even in the church, three out of ten that are attending aren't even in the church, we have a huge need to find people who are far from God. That means out of the people you work with, most of them probably don't know the Lord. And look at the way they live, the way they act. What do they turn to when life gets tough? What are they treasuring? What are they with their life? So we believe that our purpose is to help people that are far from God find this liberty and life in Jesus. People come from all different backgrounds. Most of them don't know that they are far from God. That's the interesting thing. So we're living our life. We're doing small groups. We're doing worship on Sunday mornings, doing these events together, celebrating baptism, worshiping together. We worship loud on purpose because we won't. I've got somebody that comes to our church and says, I love the fact the music's loud. I can't sing, but I can't hear myself. It's by design. We're not, we're not trying to drown anybody out, but we want, we want this to be a welcoming place for people. But we know that apart from God moving, many, many people are far from God. There, ne- there needs to be a place for them. That's our purpose. Number four, I would tell you what they would tell us from the scriptures, that spirit-filled delegation leads to growth. Look what it says. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them. You know what it means when you give somebody responsibility? It means they may not do it your way. Do we have any control freaks in the room? You know who you are. Confess it. There's freedom in the truth. When, when I ask somebody to do something, it means they most likely aren't going to do it my way. Stephanie, we'll talk about this together. And, and it's okay. Stephanie, she, she did a little hand raise. There are more of you. She's just the, the leader of you. It means that it's okay. It's okay to say it's, it gives God more glory for the thing to get done by more people than simply one person doing it. We need to work on this as a church. This is, this is one of our weaknesses. Spirit-filled delegation brings or leads to growth. Because it means more people are involved, more people can serve, more people feel like they're a part of something. We want to be a church that looks at people and says, here are the things God has called us to accomplish, and you're here, we think God would like for you to help us do that thing. The next thing we can learn from this is that God already has in place or will bring everyone needed to accomplish his goals. Do y'all believe that? I love it when, when God brings us people, because all of y'all were brought by the Lord. When we started the church, church will be six years old in October. You cannot say, I, I saw that billboard. We have never spent a dollar on a billboard. You cannot say, I got the mass mail out. I got that mail out. We're not against mass mail outs, but we just have never, we never done one. You, you can say, somebody invited me. We do that a lot. That's one of our main things. Or you can say, I saw it on Facebook. We do that a lot. But you can never say, so I believe that God ultimately brings people to it. Some people come for a season. Some people come for a longer season. I know this. I believe that God is doing everything he wants to do in his power to, to help us be who we need to be to reach people. We're seeing them in the go. And, you know, part of being at a, a little vulnerable moment for you, being at a small church, is I'm always fearful for my children. that Are they going to get the same experience? And that's just an honest thing. And the Lord has reminded me over and over again, I'm the Holy Spirit. A facility, a larger ministry is not the Holy Spirit. Your job is one thing, to trust me. And so um, we come in this morning, and, and Hudson's counting down with the 20, 19, his little Mickey Mouse voice, 18, and then he hits here and goes, church time! He's pumped. And we're singing, and he comes over. He goes, Daddy, are you preaching this morning? I see. He goes, yes. Which he's not even here for it, so I'm not sure that even means. My little heart, you know, swelling. And then as we're singing, he comes over, filming a little, little, little body shovel next to me, look over his little... His little hand, Hudson has curved pinkies, by the way. He's got something going on, I don't know what it is, but his little curved pinky hand is that worship in the Lord. And that all happened in the confines of a little church. You know what that means? That means the Holy Spirit of God is one that does the heart growth and the heart change and does whatever he wants to do. I would rather be 
exactly where God wants me to be, whether that's a church of 10,000 or a church of five, than to be at a place that I'm not supposed to be. I believe with my whole heart more than ever before that God is going to do everything that he wants to do through this place. And if you're here, you're part of that. And there are people you and I need to be bringing in. They're going to be part of that as well. He's going to do what he's going to do. He already has in place or he is bringing. Look what it says. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men. Where does it say next? From among you. That means that means one, they were Christians. That the among you is they're part of the fellowship. But it means you don't have to go out looking out like, man, we need to reach some people. We gotta go find somebody that can do it. No, it's you. We say we need to be leading people to Jesus. You don't be like, well, God, I pray you'd give me somebody that's extroverted, because that's sure enough it me. No, it's you. From among you. Who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We'll turn the responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer. And ministry of the word. Number six, we obey him. The Holy Spirit will bring wonderful solutions. Y'all believe that? Do you believe that we can trust the Lord and pray and seek God's face? Say, God, we'd love to see more people baptized. Or we'd love to see this or that. And we can trust God knowing he'll do what he says he's going to do. I've seen it a thousand times. God, God is faithful. You are, you are not here or, or wherever, whenever you came a Christian, you can say it was a powerful song that day, whatever. You can say it was a good preacher that day, whatever. You could say there was a video. Here's the reason you're a saved person, because the Holy Spirit of God reached out of heaven and, and stirred your heart and changed you and drew you. And you don't even know the, the dozens, if not hundreds of things happening before that, maybe even things before you were alive where God was paving the way and drawing your heart to you. It could be through a grandparent's prayer. It could be through a church service as a child. But know this, that your salvation, your redemption has been an orchestrated event from the beginnings of time. That's what it says in Ephesians. Before the foundations of the world, Christ is working out this plan to save you. Isn't that a wonderful thing to think about? That Christ says, not only am I going to build my church, I'm going to start drawing the members. I'm going to recruit them before they're even born. Isn't that phenomenal? Doesn't that give you peace that the God of the universe has been intimately involved in getting you into his organization, into his church? It should. Verse 5, which is amazing. Somebody said the most miracle thing, the most miracle verse in the whole Bible. This proposal pleased the whole group. That is not my HOA, even if I propose the tunnel. Bring the, next time, I'm going I'm to do that. I'm going to propose the tunnel next time. Now here's what's interesting. Who are the people that were complaining? The Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews. These names are all Greek-based names. So here's what's interesting about it. If you're the Hebraic Jews, one's being complained, the temptation would be like, we're going we're to get somebody to take care of you, but we're going to make sure there's some of us. They didn't do that. They said, who's the best ones for the job? And the seven men they picked were all people of Greek background. These names are all Greek background names. It meant the Holy Spirit's ruling and reigning. They're not doing what they wanted. They're doing what the Spirit of God. They presented these men, the apostles, and these names. They prayed, laid hands on them. And the last thing is this. Unity creates an environment for the spirit to flourish. Unity creates, unity doesn't mean you and I see eye to eye on every single thing. Y'all know that, right? If you're in a marriage, you don't, you don't have 100% agreement on every, if you do, one of you is just lying. You don't. You're not going to see every, but the things that matter you agree on, right? That mar, married people agree with that? You don't agree on every single thing. If, if you believe that, ask, where do you going to go eat? My, my response, Jamie has like three restaurants she hates. She hates Chinese food, Wendy's, and I don't know what else. But if, I'm like, we're going to go eat. She goes, I don't know. I'm like, let's go get Chinese food and go to Arby's for, or go to Wendy's for dessert. No. It, you're not going to groan everything. You're not. But the things that matter, we agree on. So here's what this, at the end of it, it says this. Unity creates environments. They present these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. So the word of God spread. The, word, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So where there's unity, when people understand what their point is, what their mission is, sometimes unity means you're so consumed with the main purpose that the other stuff doesn't even matter, right? The church where the guy got upset about the ham, he needed a job to do. He, he had too much time on his hands to worry about ham. People don't, don't care when, 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 when things are drastic and, and, and emergencies are happening. The things that don't matter don't matter. What matters the most is, 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 is taking care of the emergency at hand. So here's how do we respond to this truth. I'm going to give you a few little things real quick. Number one, praise Jesus for his church. 
I remember the last time you said, God, just thank you for the church. I know Neil thanks God for the church every day. You love the church. I, I love the, the local missionaries that just, they adore the church. You get this, you've been in, what, two churches today already? How, how, many, how many, Neil interacts with dozens of ministers and preachers and leaders, and, and you see the ins and outs, the different personalities. Each church has a different angle, a different thing they do, one thing they're great at. But you need to be thankful for, for the church. You need, to be, you need to say, God, thank you so much for the church. When you drive by a church, it's never a competition. Thank God for that church. They may do th- you may not ever be comfortable there. They may do things differently than you, but thank God for it. Jesus said, you know, and Paul said, you know what, I don't care. As long as they're preaching Christ crucified, I'm thankful for them. We have a tendency to make a little bit about a competition sometimes. So, one, praise Jesus for his church. Number two, check your own membership. Check and make sure you're part of the church. And I don't mean like just catalyst. I mean church overall. Has there been a time when you confessed your need for Jesus? Not have you heard the things about Jesus. Not do you have some intellectual knowledge about Christ. Not was I, my granddaddy was a preacher. None of that stuff. But has there been a time when you said, I need forgiveness. I know that I can't save myself. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm rebellious. I'm stubborn. I'm stiff-necked. I'm prideful. I think I can do it myself. Has there been a time when you said, I need God through the person of Jesus Christ to save me? Check your membership. The Bible says it's good for us to consider our days. It's not a complicated thing. The Bible says things like if you confess through the mouth of the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. They asked Jesus at some point, what is eternal life? He said it's to know me. So know me, I I am eternal life. And if you know me, you know eternal life. You'll experience eternal life. So check your own membership. It doesn't matter how much you know about him. Do you know him? Do you know Christ? When things are tough and things are great, do you find, are you in relationship with, with God through Christ? Number three, remind yourself of our why as a church. Sometimes we forget that sometimes. Sometimes we forget that we're here so the people that are far from God can find life and liberty in Jesus. Sometimes that, that means that you may be serving in an area that's kind of thankless sometimes. Remember, we're doing this so people that are far from God can find life and liberty. If you're working with preschool or children, I commend you because they're mamas and daddies that need a break. This may be their only hour of sanity. It may be. I mean, truthfully, you are loving a child and you're pointing a child to Jesus. But it, the bigger thing may be even that that mama can go, I don't have any kids for a little while. We have some people in our neighborhood that have triplets. They're riding around their little, and they're like little seven-month-old little girls. And I was like, ooh, that is tiring. I met a guy the other day. His family, he's one of five. He's a quintuplet. He says, are your, are your parents good people? He goes, my mama is the best person I've ever met in my entire life. Well, she should be. Five of them. Five of them. I'm like, here's your diapers and Xanax. I mean, Tough. Remind yourself of your life. Number four, pray and invite people. I wish this was like number one through seven over and over again. God moves when we pray. Now, God moves regardless sometimes. He does what he wants to do. But I know this. I know in my life, and maybe he's just aligning my heart with his heart. But I know when I say, God, will you put somebody in my life today that I can talk with and share the gospel with? On that day, notoriously, somebody will say, hey, Matt, I'm having a horrible time. Why do you always smile? I've had that conversation. And that morning I said, God, would you just send me somebody I could pray with, I could share the gospel with? So that's a prayer God answers. So number one, pray and then invite. You all know somebody that, is, that, that you would say, I'm not certain that they know the Lord. Don't, don't we all know that person? You all know somebody. Somebody in a cubicle, somebody down, the, down the, the street from your house, a neighbor, somebody on a sports team, somebody you've shared a class with, somebody that's in your phone. We're the most connected people in the, in, in the history of our world, and, and we have less deep connections we have foul if we added all the facebook friends this room thousands and thousands and thousands of facebook friends and instagram or whatever the latest thing is but pray and invite number five serve in line with your gifts find a way i love watching matt wheeler drum don't you love watching wheeler drum you were designed to be on a drum set wheeler now i have created a verb for the way you drum it's called he gorillas the drums he doesn't play them softly. He, he, I love it. No, I love it. But I, I love the fact that at some point in life, Matt Wheeler found a, what, what, what game was it, Wheels? He found Rock Band, and that's how he learned to drum. And we're like, wait a minute, he's actually pretty, he's actually pretty good at it. 
And he got thrown up on a real set, like, real soon after that. It was like baptism by fire, throw you in the river, learn how to swim. And, and now we get to watch this guy. He's toured with professional bands. We get to watch this guy use his gifts. I love watching Richard and John, all the folks up here and read, all the ones that can play and the singers using their gifts. We, want, we believe that God has given people unique gifts to serve the kingdom. And you're most happy when you're using those gifts. And the last thing. And Jamie mentioned this. We haven't even talked about it this morning. I want you to lean in to what God's doing. Do y'all know about, about body language? If you ever talk to somebody and they cross their arms or they turn their body, you know what they're doing? They're, they're deflecting you. You ever notice this deal? In personal counseling, they say if you're talking to somebody, let's say if you and I are sitting and, you're, and I'm, I'm trying to, to deal with Neil and we're sitting like this, this means I'm open to you. you know, what, 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 can we, what can we learn together? I'm, I'm open to your counsel. I'm open to your truth. But if I do this, turn my head, make eye contact over here, that means, that means I'm like, I don't really respect what you're saying. I don't receive all of it. Let me tell you what God wants from us. God wants us to be like this. Lord, just whatever you want from me. You see the difference? God, whatever you want. And as a church, I believe the more of us say, God, whatever you want. Whatever you want. A long time ago, I said, Lord, just whatever. Yes. <laughs> I got a plan, but the Bible says a man has a plan. That's not God's plan, so God's going to do his thing. But God, just what, what do you want? What do you want to do? And I know that when I lean into the Lord, that wonderful things happen. And this scripture is about people who said this. God, we saw this, this, this turmoil, this tension, these people complaining, and they didn't, they didn't fuss at them. Yell, they, they sought to solve the problem. They got the problem taken care of. They delegated through the Spirit, and they said this. And it says, and the word of God spread rapidly. And the last line says, and many priests came to Christ. People that were like not even... Believers in Jesus, that's a big thing. They just had one little line, and many priests came to Christ. So I believe if you and I say this, Lord, what, what do you want to do with us? We, we pray that as a church, but start with you. God, what, what do you want to do with my life? What do you want me to be? Do you want me to lead a small group? Do you want me to, to be about going and inviting people on, on Sundays? Do you want me to go out and, and share the gospel with guests? What do you want me to do, Lord? But just know this, God, I'm open to whatever you want. I'm not closed off to you. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm open to whatever my body and my spirit says to you. Just kind of whatever you want, Lord. We're going to sing, and uh, this is a wonderful song about God's extravagant love. I, I pray that, um, that for you, that you'll hear the scripture, and that you'll hear that, yes, there will be tensions in any organization, right? You, we all know that. But it doesn't change the purpose of the organization. It doesn't change why God has saved us and redeemed us and built this church. And that we can stay focused and stay in line with what he wants, knowing that the results come from this unity that he brings. I'm going to pray for us. The altar is going to be open if you need to pray. Uh, obviously, if you have a question about your own eternal uh, life, that if you don't know the Lord, if you have never confessed your need for Christ, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. We don't want to rush that with you. We'd like to have some time for that. Um, but let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for the way you love us. God, thank you for grace. Thank you for the scriptures. Lord, I know that um, apart from the Holy Spirit moving, that we would just butt heads all the time. God, we would run into each other. And we got to know when your Spirit's ruling and reigning, you bring solutions to tensions. And, and God, like these disciples, said, you know what? It's not Our main purpose is not to wait on tables. We need to be about praying and, and ministering of the Word. God, I pray that we would remember as a church that we believe because of Scriptures and what you put in our hearts that, that our main purpose is to see people that are far from you, that are distant from you, who maybe have been hurt by Christians, who maybe have been just never even known you, God. Whatever the reason, doesn't even matter, but where they are is they're far from you. That we believe that our purpose is to see them to find life and liberty in Jesus. And so, God, I pray for us as a body that we would just lean into that. God, we wouldn't be selfish. We wouldn't say, what do I want? We'd say, God, what do you want? What is the thing that I can do to help bring people closer to you? So we love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name.